So very good morning to all of you. I must thank Professor Mitchell and uh, other organizers for inviting me to give a talk. I think myself and Janeshwar are the only geneticist and non-archaeologist present in this uh, hall. I hope that uh, we'll not make it too complicated to understand and make it very simple and uh, try to tell as a story that how genetics play a major role in understanding population history, particularly I'm going to focus on uh, Indian population history. <clears throat> so when we talk about any population study, there's no other place than India. Yeah, because of the complexity in terms of uh, diversity exist in uh, Indian subcontinent. It's not exaggeration to say that India is an ethnic museum because we have collection of large number of population groups. Uh, you can see the range of uh, population existing in India. There are groups who typically look like uh, Africans. There are group typically look like European. There are group typically look like uh, Southeast Asian. There are group which are very unique to India. It doesn't look like any other uh, population outside India. Uh, in terms of looking at the population history, of course, you're all try to understand <clears throat> using archaeological tool to understand the population history. Uh, but unfortunately, we don't have a good archaeological um, site, not really to understand archaeology, but to understand the population history. <clears throat> because most of the place, we don't find the biological material as it was done uh, in Europe because one of the study where we are part of it, <clears throat> where there are 7,000 and 8,000 year old bone sample have been used so very successfully. And uh, this was shown that uh, the present day Europeans have been contributed by three different sources. Uh, although there are large number of archaeological sites, which are several thousands of year old, particularly here, the one which was found in Jolapuram by uh, another Michael group, uh, evidence shows that either human or human-like population survived here because they used uh, developed modern tools. But unfortunately, there was no biological material to understand about uh, whether the human lived or any other species have lived how many thousand years back and so on. But this shows about 70,000 years. So that's uh, lacunae existing uh, in India in terms of analyzing the biological material. There are places where the bones have been found. This is one of the examples where Kiredi near Madurai, the intact skeleton was found, but again, it's not very old, few thousand year old. Similarly, Archanalur, uh, where we got some sample from Dr. Subramaniam, but still that's uh, in the process of analyzing. <coughs> But one successful story, again, within India, there's no other place where we could uh, get very high quality DNA is from Arafa, of course, uh, along with uh, Professor Shinde and many other collaborators. And that sample have been uh, subjected to whole genome sequencing, uh, where you can see the principal component analysis. I'll not go into detail, but ultimately what I wanted to highlight here is that, uh, so this is the Indus Valley sample or Harappan sample, our sample collected from Rocky Greek. So that consists of two different uh, genome. One is of the ancestral Indians. I'll come a bit late about that. They, particularly the Andaman, Andamanis, Andaman hunter and gatherers. Other major chunk of that has come from Iranian hunter gatherer. Of course, the sample is not very old. The sample is only around 3000 BCE. But the genome is related to Iranian hunter-gatherer, which are of more than 10,000 BCE. Okay, this has different implication, of course. When talk about agriculture, it was known that the agriculture has come from Iran. Then you would expect that Iranian farmer's genome would have been here. So that also uh, indicate that agriculture must have uh, independently originated in Indian subcontinent. Of course, that's 
different kind of thing. So we don't have much of the biological samples which was excavated from, which was obtained from the place where the archaeological sites um, in many part of the uh, uh, part in the country has been uh, done. That's a very, very uh, sad part of it. Uh, this is another study, of course, the samples, there are 500 bone samples from South and Central Asia. Unfortunately, again, as I said, there's no biological material within Indian subcontinent. There are 500 bones. This is one of the largest um, ancient DNA study where, uh, again, it's not showing or giving any clue about uh, the uh, the ancient Indian population origin and so on. But briefly to tell about this, it has shown that uh, Yamnaya fossilites have migrated on both the side. They are the one probably taken the Indo-European language to India, again it's not very old, 1000 to 2000 BCE. They also taken that to uh, Europe. Okay, So these are the some of the ancient DNA study, again, it's not telling anything about when did the modern human arrived in Indian subcontinent. In the absence of archaeological tools or archaeological samples, which is very, very important to understand how the genome was at that time, when did the modern human arrived in Indian subcontinent, but the availability of the endogamy population in India provides large number of genetic opportunity for us to analyze that genome and come to the conclusion. So which I'll tell you very briefly. Uh, one of the population which I mentioned was the Andaman tribes. So we had opportunity to visit the, the tribal populations, particularly uh, in the very deep um, island called Dogong Creek. We collected the sample from Onge, uh, Great Andamanis and Jarvas. And we have sequenced their complete mitochondrial DNA to trace the maternal lineage to tell about the non-scientific audience that the mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell which we all inherit only from the mother. So we want to trace the maternal lineage, we use the mitochondrial DNA sequence. When we sequenced, we found there are several unique mutations. These numbers indicates that is the position, the mitochondrial DNA is 16.5 KB or 16,500 base pair. So at 200 position, there's a difference. Again, again, at 1,524 position, there's a difference. So we put all of them together because these positions are the variation, these positions are not exist anywhere in the world. It's a very unique uh, mutation. And we try to calculate the age of the population and it uh, turned out to be around 64, uh, 65,000 to 70,000 years. So based on this information, we came to the conclusion that probably Andaman tribes are the first modern human migrated out of Africa, taking southern coastal route and reached Andaman and Nicobar Islands about 65,000 years back. So that is the power of the genetic tool. And similarly, because we, we are also talking about South Asia, uh, there was another study in the same issue of science uh, where they studied the population called Orang Asli in uh, Malaysia. They also came to the same conclusion that the coastal route is a plausible one. And there was a write-up by combining both the study by Peter Foster and shown the route of early human migration. So that's one other story. The second one, what I'm going to talk, of, uh, talk to you about, what was the population in the prehistoric India? So this is another, again, very high impact uh, study where use large number of population group representing all the linguistic family, all the social uh, structure and so on. So we come to the conclusion in this study. Uh, in fact, we reconstructed the Indian population history, and we have shown that in the prehistoric India, there are two founding populations. One we call them as ancestral South Indians, other one is ancestral North Indians. The ancestral South Indians are the part of the early human migration, while the Andamanis were migrating, some groups stayed in southern part of India, whom we call as ancestral 
uh, South Indian, and the ancestral North Indian probably migrated later on. And if you recollect that, the study which I showed uh, where the Yamnaya uh, uh, postulates uh, migrated probably, that is much more recent, similar kind of migration have taken place. This tells about the whole story about Indian populations. These are all different Indian population groups. These are Europeans, Africans, and Chinese, uh, where you see that all of them are in a single cluster. That means genetically they are more homogeneous, whereas Indian population, everybody is very, every population is unique because of the endogamy marriage, marrying within the group. I don't have time to explain most of it, but I'll tell you about the impact of uh, uh, these two groups. So what happened? Uh, these two groups initially gave rise to many population groups and during the last two to four thousand years they all admixed uh, as the color indicate that means the genomes are admixed. That's an indication of that even look at take one of the phenotype like color, right? Unlike many part of the world in India we have color ranging from very dark skin to very light skin and in between there are a lot of color that itself indicates there's a genome admixture. After that last two, uh, 2000 years, everybody is marrying within the group. So that's what makes every population as very unique. In addition, there are several other migrations happened very recently to tell you about uh, after migrating again, the Siddhis who have migrated about 400 years back. Again, there's a lot of admixture happen and uh, the Jewish once again you can see the Indian Jewish they are mostly looking like uh, Indians because of the genome uh, again I'm not going to detail because of the time this is about Parsis again you can see there's an admixture the color indicates like you can think that uh, the green color is most of Indian you can still have some kind of uh, Indian genome in that so all of them put together makes India a very complex nation uh, in terms of diversity. And we have uh, 4,635 population groups, including tribes, primitive tribes, and so on. Since we are talking about South Asia, I just want to highlight what is unique about South Asia and how India uh, can be looked at in view of uh, other South Asian countries. This is just a couple of examples. One example, is in terms of disease, just one disease I'm highlighting. Uh, there's a one particular mutation which causes cardiomyopathy, this heart muscle disease uh, in the myosin binding uh, uh, protein C3 gene. You can see that mutation is prevalent among South Asian countries, right? So whatever we talk about India is also true for other South Asian uh, countries. This is another study again Using the population data, we try to understand, so what is uniqueness about India and South Asia? This tells about, there's a lot of opportunity for us to identify a population specific disease causing mutations. Uh, that earlier I showed that uh, there are a large number of population groups in India which maintain the endogamy, in the sense marrying within the population. That's what creating more mutations within the family. Therefore, uh, there are several examples which I'm not going uh, because of the limitation time. So these are some of the unique points which I wanted to uh, highlight. Uh, with that, I would like to thank all those who have contributed. Dr. Lalji Singh, Neeraj, some of you know both of them, and my colleagues. David, a very good collaborator, Nyaneshwar, who is here going to present and many more uh, who have contributed to this study. Thank you very much.